Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. On deck, we have the 6 amp power fist reciprocating saw. Just atrocious. It's got surface mount components that have been soldered on by a blind apprentice. Apparently, this factory subscribes to the bigger the gob, the better the job philosophy. But 35 bucks an inch it costs to use this saw. Seems a little pricey. But sometimes in life, you got to sit down and eat your share of turd sandwich. Uh, this is one of those times. I need your help. This is from Princess Auto, and Princess Auto is the Canadian version of Horrible Freight. So roughly the same tool. We're going to check out what $30 will get you in the way of a reciprocating saw. That's not even 30 greenbacks either. That's Canadian pesos. So we're going to have some fun with this one. It's a Del Cheapo. And I've been around long enough to know that cheap tools for me just are not worth the frustration. Uh, normally, I would take this apart before turning it on, but I'm not sure it's even going to work. So we're just going to run it real quick, uh, make sure it works. And not too smelly. Just a slight top note of fried durian with a base note of Nigerian mangrove swamp illegal refinery. Comes with its own plastic bag. Oh, holy, look at this. Right out of the box. Just got a bad case of the Weeble Wobbles. I like to look through this mainly because I want to find some chinglis to laugh at. Don't judge me. We all do it. Nah, this is actually not too bad, other than being just ugly. There's no real funny chinglish. Strike one. Right out of the box, I gotta say, I'm disappointed. I, I expected better from Power Fist. Here is the felt wiper, and it's uh, busted right clean half and two. And I don't know what this strain relief is, but it's not relieving any strain. It's just loosey-goosey on there. It's made out of some sort of vinyl pleather, likely reject from the Chinese Velveeta factory. Okay, got her plugged in. And she chooches. It claims at a no-load speed of 2,500 beats per minute. I'm going to test that out here. Now we're right on the money. $25.99. Well, we've successfully whispered a few sweet nothings. Let's see if we can enter the secret garden. i got to take this boot off, but I can't get this shoe to move. This first time tight, second time all right. Okay, this is interesting. Got the boot off, and you can see here the molded plastic parts. Uh, I guess the mold is so thin that the parts break through. You can see there's no uh, uh, like paper thin. And that's not worn or anything, that's right out of the factory mold. So that's actually in the mold that is supposed to be thinner. I don't think it's supposed to be so thin that it's not there. So we got a bunch of grease in this uh, cover plate here, and it's all filthy uh, black grease. And that tells me that none of these components were cleaned after grinding. So this is all abrasive grinding dust left in there. And we pop that out. There's a little bushing. or Oh, no, it's actually a bearing, a little roller bearing. Interesting. And this is the crank pin that uh, changes the rotary motion of the motor into linear back and forth motor, uh, motion. So we can see in here, I don't know if that's hardened. Uh, we have some, it's been ground, rough ground, and then it's been spot welded into this tube, which is, uh, also ground, slightly polished on the OD. And that is uh, cheese grade steel. We got a little of the old in and out here in this bearing as an index mark to put it in here. Uh, sorry, not bearing, bushing. We're gonna try and get it off of here, have a look. Oh wow, that's, yeah, what 
is going on there. Oh, a moment of tooth. So that's just a plain, looks like cast iron bushing. And it's all chowdered up there already. Nope, nope, it's not cast iron, it's hardened. So a hardened steel bushing. Now let's see what this is. soft so we got a hardened steel bushing and a soft shaft going in and out of it that's interesting engineering and by interesting I mean terrible so I pulled the spacer plate off and here we have the crank with the counterbalance I can't get it out because uh, this is stripped came that way from the factory although I probably would have stripped it on my own so I'm gonna take the front section off Uh, that's where the magic happens. So this is very quickly degrading into uh, what's wrong with this thing. So I'm going to swap it around and I'll tell you what's right with this thing. Nice casting. Very nice aluminum casting. So they'll be able to go back to their engineering team and uh, shave a few pennies off this and make it quite a bit shittier in the next iteration. Now someone was kind enough to preach out or this fastener at the factory i want to have a look at these spiral bevel gears so just the the plain bevel gears but uh, i gotta drill that out first i got a very nice left hand drill bit it's a little oversized but it should work now generally speaking anytime you're trying to extract something you might as well just go straight for the bottle wrench because uh, <laughs> it gets progressively worse and worse you start off with the left hand drill bit and then you get your extractor that doesn't where you break it blah 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 you end up just mangling the shit out of it. But anyway, I'm a sucker for punishment. We're going to give her a try with the left hand drill bit. And we got to go in the right direction. Look at that. Easy as pie. It's almost like it was staged. All right, managed to finesse her out, but uh, not without some collateral damage stove that in pretty good i hit the inner race and i uh, didn't realize it was retained there wasn't really thinking but even the most casual of observers could tell that uh, all i needed was a bigger hammer i was using my fine adjustment pink handled stanley ball peen and what i needed was uh, little bertha so not a problem i'm pretty sure that was factory weekend so we'll uh We'll just stove that back out and press onwards and outwards. This is a spiral bevel gear set because the pinion goes directly through the center line of the crown gear shaft. And uh, it's ugly. It's bad. If you look at this, the motor otherwise is okay, this rotor, but this pinion is just terrible. I mean, it's razor, razor sharp and uh, all the bearing surface is right at the very tip here. So we're going to pull out the craptacular microscope here and have a look. Hey, I just had a brainwave. This craptacular microscope is actually not tea bag. It's the base that really sucks. So look at this. It fits perfectly into a sterret mag base. Problem solved. -ed. There we go. Well, that's the cutting edge of the gear there, which coincides to the loaded side of the gear. Ah, oh, for fuck's sakes. Fuck you, Java. Jesus H. Christ. So there's the top of the gear, machining marks. Uh, the, even the machining marks from, from pre-grinding or pre-hobbing are... Uh, Pretty scuzzy looking compared to uh, the Makita gear that I had apart there recently. There's a loaded part of the gear. Let's turn the turn the volume down here on the light. You can see there's some sort of black goop on there. Well, there it is. I don't know. She's she's pretty pretty ugly. The knife edge of the gear is actually rolled over, and that should not be a knife edge, but there it is. And that's the uh, that's the bearing surface. That, that's what actually transmits the torque, and it's right at the very tip of the pinion. 
which uh, is terrible gear seating, but uh, I guess that's what you get. That's about as bad as you can get and still have something uh, work. Okay, and this is the crown gear. We can see the machine marks. This crown gear must have came from another factory than the, uh, than the pinion. And the pinion is just machined into the rotor. And actually, otherwise, the rotor, like the electric motor rotor, looks great. It's just that uh, pinion machining is horrendous. Okay, so having a look at the motor rotor. And surprisingly, it's not all 608 skate bearings. This one's a uh, 6000Z. And the Z just means a deep ball, deep groove ball bearing. So it's got a deeper groove and it's better at taking uh, axial thrust than a, a standard bearing, standard roller bearing. Here's the fan. You'll notice it's straight blades and the, and the mold for that is quite rough. You see all the sprue lines and all that crap left over. But otherwise it, it looks pretty nice. It's nice and tight. Uh, the commutator bars are nice and deep. On the back side, same thing. Shielded bearing. It'd be greased for life. It's uh, DUF is the manufacturer. I have no idea who that is. Uh, it must be some cut rate guy in Guangzhou that doesn't have a website because uh, can't find him anywhere. Now this is 24 gauge wire, about uh, half a millimeter. And that is interesting because if you look here at the Makita saw that I took apart, they were running 50 amps through 18 gauge, which is uh, 0.82 millimeters squared. So they were running comparatively 18.3 amps per millimeter squared of copper. Now these guys, we got 24 gauge, which is um, about half a millimeter and uh, in diameter and the cross-sectional area is 20 millimeters squared. And they're running six amps rated through this 20. So copper comparing apples to apples. So they're running twice the amperage through the same, comparatively through the same amount of copper. So obviously it's gonna get hotter. The hotter the wire is, the shorter the lifetime of the insulation. So this motor actually is not nearly as robust, surprise, surprise, as a comparative Milwaukee or Makita. What did I say? So yeah, yeah, math. Beep. I, you can come back now. It's, it's all over. So here's one of the brushes, just a little wee guy. It's only running six amps and uh, fairly hard. No porosity. Eh, nothing wrong with that. Looks like it's connected well. No complaints. And here's the brush holder. Nothing wrong with that. Nice heavy brass section. Well machined, nicely broached. No complaints there. Yeah, the field windings, nothing wrong with that. Very nice. Located by two little fasteners there and uh, very nicely connected. You can see there's heat shrink down there. All those nice big brass posts. And of course the rear bearing housing. Plastique, can't get away from the plastique, even in focus, no less. Okay, we're gonna fire up the HACO and see how hot we need to get in order to melt the housing. We're starting at 201. 201 is fine. I'm gonna go to 301. 301 is fine. It is quite cold in here, but uh, maybe about 10 degrees centigrade. Okay, 350C is melting it. So this is the same exact plastic as in the Makita. Well, that surprises me, but uh, hey, that's a good thing. I got the D handle split apart here and, and I just confirmed what most of you suspected. I'm an idiot. So this little chuchur here is to allow this thing to spin around so you can reposition the handle. Now the only problem of course is there's no physical stop and there's nothing from preventing you from turning this until it's twisted up like a pretzel and comes apart in your hand. Now this is interesting, this wire is 600 volt and 105 degree C rated, which is, uh, which is actually good quality. And here's a little triac 
switch here. This is like a dimmer switch for your lights. You can see we got a shows we got a capacitor and switch and and there's your uh, triac there. But there's going to be some more in there than just that diagram because there's a trimmer pod on there for adjustamente. So we got it apart. We might as well have a look at it. It's, uh, it's actually not a bad switch. It uh, doesn't have a real positive snap action, but it does have a snap action. And uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's kind of a crappy switch, actually. Interestingly enough, though, like the Makita, it's uh, UL, or rather RU, Canadian and uh, US rated. Now, whether or not that's legit or not, I'm not sure, but it's stamped on there. Let's have a look at it, shall we? And I can see now why it feels so clunky. There's the first clunk there of that contact, and then there's the second clunk. So first clunk, and then we go into speed control with the dimmer switch, essentially. And then you push harder, and it clunks over this guy. Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack. Intermission. This is the best part of any teardown. If you'll allow me, gentlemen, I have an important favor to ask. Now, I'm not a man who asks for help easily or takes it lightly. Most of the time, I'd rather just put my head down and power through on my own than ask for help. But sometimes in life, you got to sit down and eat your share of turd sandwich. Uh, this is one of those times. I need your help. I really enjoy making these teardown videos. I get a laugh out of all the comments and consistently I learn something. This is the kind of stuff that you don't get from fancy book learning. I do some cool oddball stuff you just don't see anywhere else. But I'm getting murderated on how much these vids cost. Check this out. $10.74. Yikes. Now, I don't mind dipping into my beer and smokes money and I really appreciate you guys offering to send me tools and gear. But what I don't want is one guy to spend a hundred bucks of his hard earned cash on postage. What we really need is for our buddies to step up and throw five bucks into the hat. Now on aggregate, we'll be able to do a lot more damage if there's a whole bunch of guys that help out a little tiny bit rather than one or two guys that drop a hundred bucks on postage. And I'd just like to say that clearly the, from the comments, the guys watching these vids are super funny, super smart, SMRT, and I'm sure a lot of them would love to make vids, but just don't have the time. Well, my friends, this is your chance to shine. This is your time. Step up, help me make these vids. Uh, there's a link in the doobly-doo to Patreon. Just sign in and throw a few bucks in the hat. And we can all share, laugh, maybe learn something, maybe even make the world a better... Uh, I check Patreon out online, there's Skookum. Uh, lots of YouTube channels use Patreon because it works. It helps get more vids made. Now I expect a lot of you know exactly where I'm coming from and you're more than willing to lend a hand. So thank you in advance for your help. It's really like buying a buddy a beer, only one that you get to enjoy. So it's a win-win. Please make sure you tell me if you don't want your name in the credits or your channel in the credits and please Clink the link below now in the doobly-doo. It's possibly on the vid as well if I can get the ones and zeros to line up. Thank you very much. Back to the chair now. So we're gonna have a look at that with the microscope. Because microscope. You can see the check ball coming up there, the detent ball. And that's that second clunky bit. There'd be a circuit board on the other side for the triac control. Now we're gonna flip this over and you're gonna see something. You need to shake your head. This is out of this world. Okay, so here's the dimmer board and it is just atrocious. It's got surface mount components that have been soldered on by a blind apprentice, likely missing some fingers as well. This is an on semiconductor knockoff here, this triac, and they actually have the same part number as on semi, it's a BTB08-600B. 
So there's the DIAC there, that orange looking thing. And then uh, we got the uh, slide potentiometer here, those two vertical, horizontal vertical lines. But we're going to take a microscope shot of that so you can see the horrors. So there's the slide potentiometer that uh, controls how much of the waveform gets clipped, the AC waveform. I'll explain that in a little second. So the further out the, the wipers get, the higher the resistance. As they move in, the lower the resistance. And they got a nice little skim of dielectric goo on there. I'm trying to get a look at that here. See if we can get that schmoo off. See what that uh, component is. Now I got out my UV balloon popping laser to see if I could see what that uh, device was. Just shined it on there and fluoresces, but the ink is brown, so that didn't work. But then I just cleaned off the grease, and sure enough, there it is. A4T and a 29. No clue. And uh, yeah, look at that uh, beige capacitor there. Just gobbed in there. Horrific. <laughs> That's a cute little resistor on there. I don't think it's going anywhere. Apparently this factory subscribes to the bigger the gob, the better the job philosophy. Look at this poor little resistor. What is one step beyond tombstoning? This is that. There is no way that this switch is legitimately certified and listed. No way. Total fake. Then this brass backing plate is the heat sink for this, but it's, it's epoxied on there. Uh, so, yeah. This triac is going to get hotter than a $2 pistol, and that will fail in a hurry. But luckily, all that will happen is you'll miss out on your adjustable speed. You'll still have no throttle and full throttle. So here's a little protector choo-choo. It looks like heat shrink, but it ain't shrunk. Sure was. Unshrunk, heat shrink. What's the point? Oh, I know. When you actually run this thing, the wires get so hot from being undersized that this shrinks on to where it's supposed to be. Yeah, pretty wily, them power fist guys. Okay, well, that's pretty much it. We're going to put it back together, see if it still works. Uh, I just noticed this, though. This is cute. On the back bearing, they got a chintzy little Buna N spacer because it doesn't fit in here. Wow. Surprised they didn't use uh, felt like the, the wiper for the rod. Oh my god, this thing gets better and better. It's like peeling an onion. Layer after stinky layer till you're left with nothing but tears. Flathead screw with one of these weirdo lock washers. Small faster lock washer through this plate. It doesn't even have a proper hole in it. It's, <laughs> uh, yeah. You wonder how some guys sleep at night, eh? And I just looked at this. I had thought that this was flame hardened, but you can see here the blue extends out from the center. So this bluing is actually from heating this up so that they could press the shaft into it and it would uh, retain just by shrink fit. Oh, well, she doesn't run after this. It'll make a hell of an egg beater. Okay, let's check the gear ratio here. So 9 to 1, 2,500 strokes per minute. 9 times 25 is 225. 22,500 RPM. Holy. I don't have a new bolt to put in there, so I'm just using a right hand drill bit. Oh, come on. <laughs> Oh, come on. Boo hiss. And Nipex to the rescue. Nipex to the rescue. So the Nipex got me only so far. Now, guys that prefer to look at your vices rather than use them, you are going to want to look away. So I drilled out the center of that fastener a little bit, and I got a ball, and I'm just peening it over. And that's just a temporary stopgap measure, of course. So I'm going to go back in there take this whole thing apart once I get the correct fastener and yeah and there you go be proud to take her to the prom we're just gonna ohm out the motor see what the resistance 
Ah. Oh. Uh, I bet you that trigger. Oh, I bet you a wire came out of that trigger switch. Yeah, well, there it is. There's a culprit popped right out. If there's another problem. After it popped out, it got pinched. Son of a diddly. Okay, 4.7 ohms through the motor. Okay, we're going to test this electrically. we got it uh, working now. We're at uh, 121 on the Variac. This is just a variable transformer here. Just shoot this back and forth and you get more or less voltage. Now we're at 120 and 60 hertz. Now we'll go to manual range. You want inrush, manual range, nothing. Perfect. There we go. Now I'm just going to go full throttle. Nice and noisy. So that was pretty low, 12 amps in rush current. Well now we'll just see if the speed control works. Sure it does. Now we're at four amps. We can change the range there. So that's full throttle, no load, 3.5 amps. And uh, that'll likely come down as the gearing wears in and uh, the brushes wear in and the grease gets hot. So that is the total depth of cut that I got out of that saw, 850 thou. We'll give it the benefit of the doubt, say seven eighths. So if we take this saw and the amount of wood cut and a four by six piece of wood here, we did seven eighths for thirty bucks. That's uh, divided, uh, about thirty-five bucks an inch. It costs to use this saw. Seems a little pricey. And now I got the structural hot pink hockey tape off. I can show you. She split right half in two, stem to stern. Although on the plus side, I did manage to nearly cut through seven eighths of this wood. So I kind of had to change a heart there midway through the video. I kind of thought to myself, you know what? For thirty bucks, maybe it's not so bad. But yeah, it is so bad. Complete and utter waste of money. I should have just rolled up that 30 bucks and smoked it. Sometimes you do get what you pay for. The surprising thing, that the thing that really surprised me actually, was the variability in the quality. Like some things were fine. I, I think the motor was fine. The bearings were fine. The casting, this casting is fine. It's great, actually. Other things like the trigger and the fit and finish of the moving components garbage. In any case, the proof in the pudding is in the eating. Man, I didn't even get a chance to use my predator vision. Now, unfortunately, this saw could not complete a full pull. She done crapped out. So as was probably blatantly obvious to the most casual of observer, this saw is a piece of shit. Well, this thing works like a hot damn. 30 bucks, what a bargoon. I gotta rush out and get me three more. Thanks a lot for watching. Keep your stick on the ice.